Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Steve Call. I'm the Dean of the Graduate School of uh, Journalism here at Columbia University. Um, delighted to welcome you to this two-day sym symposium, The New Journalism. I'm sorry that we're not welcoming you downstairs in our wonderful lecture hall, but uh, I'm excited about your response to this uh, program and about the uh, journalists that we've attracted to uh, help us think through this pivotal mo moment in our uh, profession. Um, I'm welcoming you really on behalf of Columbia Journalism Review that has uh, put this together and, and uh, is really um, such an important part of our graduate school. Uh, Columbia Journalism Review has been around now for more than half a century and uh, it's a small but mighty nonprofit and if you're not already a member or a supporter of CJR, uh, please uh, consider becoming one. Um, you can find us at cjr.org and uh, even a modest uh, contribution through membership makes a big difference to our team's ability to uh, carry out its function as one of the preeminent uh, sources of press criticism and reportage uh, in the country. Um, you know, I, I think we all recognize uh, in our field in journalism, just in how many ways, uh, in how many ways this has just been an extraordinary year. Um, our field, if we were to be honest about it, was in crisis even before the pandemic. Uh, the economic uh, upheaval that has affected uh, newspapers and increasingly uh, other journalistic outlets in other media uh, was well advanced uh, before February, March. And of course, uh, it's been a dark summer in a lot of um, corners of our business. Uh, the revival uh, and the, the kind of reckoning and challenges presented by the Black Lives Matter movement this summer um, added to the sense of um, moment in journalism and brought a lot of newsrooms into conversation about how to talk honestly about race, but even beyond the role of race and racism in their own institutions, uh, bigger questions about what it asks about journalism, the stories we select, the stories we tell, the audiences we presume to, to uh, engage with. And I think, um, Probably not since the 60s um, uh, has there been such a confluence of really fundamental questioning about journalism, about its, um, about its weaknesses, about its shortcomings, but also about the opportunity to remake it. And that is really the premise of this two-day uh, symposium. The first day is um, about assessing a journalism that doesn't work. And the second is about uh, the opportunity, remaking the news. Where do we go from here? Uh, and I'm glad that um, after all of these last few years of um, trying to talk in a empirical way about the crises, overlapping crises in journalism, that we're also having a conversation about reinvention uh, because that's also underway even now, as I think we'll hear as we uh, reach the discussions tomorrow. But let's begin uh, with our first panel, uh, The Failure of News, uh, which will be moderated by the editor and publisher of uh, Columbia Journalism Review, uh, Kyle Pope, who's done just an outstanding job since uh, he came to CJR uh, maybe three, four, five years ago, uh, and uh, who has uh, played the central role in conceptualizing the symposium. So again, welcome and uh, over to you, Kyle.
Hello. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Thank you Steve, um, for that introduction and for helping frame this for us. Um, it's a, you know, um, it, it's a, um, it's one of the secrets to CJR's success that we're affiliated with a place like um, the uh, Columbia Journalism School. So um, um, we're thrilled to be, to be part. Um, this is a, I, I'm really excited about these two days. Um, it's an amazing group of people uh, that we have before us. And, you know, as Steve said, there's sort of two prongs to this issue that we're going to be looking at, which is what's wrong with the state of news, um, both in its structures and how, how, it's, how it's set up and also in its coverage, especially as we enter this critical part of the presidential election season. And then secondly, and I think equally as important, um, what are we going to do about it? And who's got ideas that are exciting? And, and you know, I, I sort of have framed this as, as um, this is an incredibly really an exciting moment to be able to rebuild the business of news and rebuild how news is done, rebuild, rethink who tells stories, who they're told to, what form all that takes. Um, so we have a real opportunity before us um, and we have to assess both things. We have to assess what hasn't worked and what we should get rid of and we have to assess what we should be looking at and how we should move forward. I'm really happy to be joined today by two people I great, greatly respect, Maria Bustillos, co-founder of Popula and um, the guiding force behind a new effort, which we'll hear more about, called Brickhouse, which actually is aimed at addressing both the structural and, and content issues that we've been talking about. And Ben Smith, um, I assume most of you on this call know um, the media columns for the New York Times, before that editor of BuzzFeed News. Hello to both of you. Hi, thank you so Hi. much for having me. Um, let me start with, let me start with Ben. Uh, ben, how are you? I'm good. It's, it's, it's a surprise to learn that you're 11 feet tall from the Zoom. <laughs> I am 11 feet tall. I'm 11 feet tall. Um, at least you're not commenting on my beard, which is what everybody else is doing. Um, very ben, very I wanna, rich and full. I want to ask you about, um, so you, you, you in the first of this year made this transition from being somebody who runs a newsroom um, to somebody who writes about the business of news and, how, and journalism for the Times. Um, of the litany of things that we've already talked about in the last couple of minutes, um, what about the sort of state of the news business did you not know or that has surprised you? Now that you're looking at it from a broader perspective. Yeah, I mean, I think when you, you know, when you're running a, an organization, you're sort of like, you're kind of talking your book all the time and sort of thinking your book all the time. And I think what's been in being in arguments about, you know, subscription versus advertising and, and these sort of like big questions about how, you know, objectivity versus advocacy, these sort of like slightly caricatured arguments and you're, and you're defending your, your own team's work and thinking about the world from that point of view. And I think the fun thing for me has been to sort of relax that a bit. And, you know, one of the things that's happening is things are just kind of splintering in all directions. Like you have the, a couple of institutions that are growing, you know, that are kind of like centralizing the mainstream around themselves. And then lots of other different people and institutions going in wildly different directions. Um, a lot of it on a pretty small scale kind of working, but none of it really replacing this, the, what's still a dying kind of like print news industry. Um, but I think, I, I think the thing that kind of surprised me was really just like the profusion of different models that are, that are working, you know, kind of working, that are starting to like show signs of life. And that's actually not a, that's not a message that we hear a lot among people who write about news. I mean, it tends to be more along the what's not working front. Um, I mean, what's uh, not working, though, is still print newspapers that still employ most journalists. I mean, you know, right. they're st still, still, still not working, and that's like a huge overhang. Right. But I remember we had a conversation before you took this job about, in fact, you wrote something for CJR about the subsidy that, that um, local newspapers get and how that's kind of get from government or from, from uh, cities in, in a lot of cases. 
and how that sort of unnaturally propped them up. Um, so, so do you, do you think the, the, the sort of like sense of crisis in local news is that, that it actually goes back much, much further than we're sort of now giving it credit for? You know, there's a lot, lots of different things, you know, as in any situation, there are lots of different things going on. One kind of unfortunate reality is that this is traditional, essentially tax subsidy. I mean, it's a, it's a strange thing, public notices, because it's actually a tax on businesses that goes directly to news organizations. I mean, nobody, the idea that the best way to publicize something is printing it in the community weekly in the age of the internet is ridiculous. Um, but it's a lever that the government traditionally used to pop up, to prop up, and to some degree, just buy the favor of the local media, but it's been there forever. Um, and as the rest of the local news business fell apart, that one pillar remained to the degree that you have sort of zombie publications that exist solely off, live, exist solely to run public notices when, to my view, that money, however you want to structure it or restructure it, could have been used to sort of underwrite a new generation of, of local media that's actually you know, ultimately reaching an audience because the problem when you sort of the problem, I think, and the risk with nonprofit media, with subsidized media, with any kind is that there's no audience and that you do work with them. That's always sort of an, if, you, if, you, if you aren't relying on, you know, advertisers to reach your audience, you aren't relying on audience revenue. There is a risk that you do kind of dull but worthy work that pleases your donors. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to come back to you and talk about where the failures in coverage are. As far as, you, as far as you see, especially as it relates to politics. Um, but Maria, let's talk about the structural issues. Um, yeah. Because it this is just, something that you're really engaged in right now. Right. I mean, this is um, listening to Ben talk about this, like, you know, where did the money go? Google and Facebook have it. You know, like, we can't really talk about this until we, um, the, the big, the elephant in the room is the money that, that people are spending to inform themselves that would ordinarily have gone to news organizations has wound up, you know, in the pockets of middlemen. I mean, we see this in every industry, whoever controls distribution controls the industry. It's like movies and, and in every other possible business you can care to name, like the, um, the sort of depredations that happened. And I really think it, it's because it happened so quickly, the internet just sort of exploded and became everyone's uh, the medium through which everyone gathers information because it's so immediate and rapid. You know, I am a person who loves Twitter. It's like, I, you can go there and say like, if something is happening in Japan, you know, and like, you know, Abe is sick or whatever, you could call your friends right now in Japan and find out in 30 seconds exactly what's going on on the ground. And I think that's like, you can't understand news and you can't understand the information economy or anything else until you really assimilate mm -hmm. that completely the immediacy of the internet and what it means and who is getting the money from it. This is like my constant, like, you know, pole star. Um, um, before I go on with Maria, I should, in the, in the interest of complete transparency, note that she's also, I'm proud to say she's our, she writes for CJR as a um, public editor focused on MSNBC and has done an amazing job there. So thank you for that. Thank you. I'm very, very proud and happy to have this job where I can actually yell about the things that upset me <laughs> in, in public. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful relief. <laughs> Let's go back to these, to these structural issues. You recently wrote a piece for us um, in which you introduced this new, uh, a new cooperative that you're forming, a news cooperative, in which you dated your concerns about all this to um, the Gawker tribe. So walk us through um, how that changed your thinking about what needs to happen structurally with news and then now what you're doing about it. Well, I was in the courtroom and it was a, it's a, sort of a slow collapse, right? Of, of my uh, faith in the uh, robustness of uh, First Amendment rights um, because, you know, I had grown up in a world where uh, William Rehnquist had defended the right of Hustler to print a, an advertisement or a joke, you know, about Jerry Falwell uh, having incest in an outhouse. Like, the, a really conservative Supreme Court judge came out and said, like, offensive things, you know, ha are protected speech. And so this was the 
um, the underpinnings of the Gawker trial were sort of based in, in these issues. And it never occurred to me in a thousand years that, that they would lose. And they had won twice in federal court, you know, for saying things that people might consider offensive. But like when, when it came down, not only that mm -hmm. a, what I consider to be a, a, a really partisan judge who was actually appointed for, uh, to the bench by Jeb Bush almost as like a reward for her um, having represented the parents in the Shivo trial. I mean, it was, there's a lot of wheels within wheels in this thing. When that all happened, none of us in the courtroom understood. It was a shock and it was horrible. And, you know, they were not allowed to uh, file an appeal on a technicality by this judge. I mean, there's, it's, very, it's a complicated and frightening story. None of us knew who was paying for that. It had actually, it was weeks before we understood that it was Peter Thiel who had bankrolled this whole thing. And so what, what really wound up emerging from that was the fact that one angry person could demolish the livelihoods of hundreds of journalists and deprive millions of people of something they like to read just because he had a lot of money and was willing to file lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit until, you know, kind of the, the cherries came up on his, on his slot machine. And it, it, it became evident to me that if I could contribute anything meaningful to this industry, it would be fighting that to, and, and exposing it and, and protecting the rights that are, that are given to us in the constitution as journalists and citizens to tell each other things that we think are true and interesting, free from any kind of interference from um, censorship or, or malignity or revenge or any other thing. We, we're supposed to be free. And so that has, that, that realization as it took place slowly over those months, um, kind of created the foundation for everything that has happened since and that was in 2016. I haven't made a single move professionally that, that didn't have that in, at the back of it. So, um, um, what tell us about Brick House? Brick House is a, um, a very exciting project. It's nine publications and uh, a bunch of us who had been involved in the civil project, which failed, was sort of a blockchain-based uh, attempt at a cooperative, and that, that failed uh, largely due to regulatory head headwinds that it, that the uh, entire, you know, sort of uh, blockchain industry faced in, in 2017, 2018. Um, so the remaining publishers from that project decided to um, continue the goal that we had to create a cooperative that was completely ad free, no executives, no investors, nobody else in it except for the journalists who are actually publishing. And you know, rather than pursue a blockchain based um, method of achieving that, we decided to develop a more conventional cooperative structure. So we spent um, a lot of months researching cooperatives and bylaws and trusts and all the different ways, ESOPs, you know, the different ways that you can achieve this kind of thing, and came up with what I think is a really, really, really great novel form of ownership that is expandable. If it succeeds, other publishers can come. Um, in my dream world, we would have a thousand publishers in this thing, uh, but for now that we're building a um, sort of entry-level version of this cooperative, uh, subscribers will get nine publications for one price. And the more it succeeds, the more we can grow it. We're sharing revenues, subscribers, expenses, intelligence, resources of all kinds. And rather than each person being motivated by the desire to further his own career, we are motivated by the desire to strengthen our industry. And I think this is a huge, huge thing that all journalists should think about. Because we are taught to compete, that we should be we should be conspiring instead. <laughs> so Ben, you mentioned that there is interesting experimentation going on out there. What do you see that's promising? Um, I mean, I think, I think like the sort of models where journalists or small publications are kind of owning their own work, it, it, like, like Brickhouse, like Defamer. I mean, it's really like, you can just see that it's, and where the audience is very intensely involved with the work, you can kind of 
see that that's working and there's excitement around it. I mean, almost by definition, there's not the kind of money there is, there was sort of like floating around for places like BuzzFeed and Vox and others, you know, five years ago. And so you're not going to see like hiring sprees at the same level. Um, I also think nonprofit news is really kind of, again, finding its feet. And that is a big kind of untapped, um, you know, kind of form of like civic engagement, basically that, that, you know, that rich people in cities are starting to see giving to the local news organization being like giving to the ballet or giving to the opera or giving to the museum. Again, like creates its own problematic dynamics where the kind of local rich people own your publication more or less or sit on your board. And that's, you know, none of these models are sort of necessarily that pure. And then I guess the last sort of interesting thing is that as Maria says, obviously the court, you know, the, the advertising industry just got swallowed by Facebook and Google as, as did a lot of content consumption. And I think there is real new pressure on them coming particularly from Australia and from the European Union, but, but, but it's already starting to kind of blow back here to, you know, essentially reach some kind of agreement, you know, reach some kind of truce with the news business. I mean, it's being driven in large part by Rupert Murdoch and by News Corp, who, are, who in Australia are just beating the hell out of them um, and, and have a very sympathetic government. So let's switch to um, campaign coverage um, then. Um, what, what, are you, what are you most worried about over the, in the next 50 days in terms of the coverage of this campaign or the mistakes that journalists could fall into? Um, let's see, I don't wanna sort of make the mistake that I feel like a lot of us who are immersed in media make, which is to say that the coverage um, like is the most important thing, that the New York Times is the most important actor in the election and the New York Times headlines are the determining factors. Like I think sometimes we take ourselves too seriously and, and people on Twitter take the media sort of as, as though it was a more powerful institution than it is. Um, that said, I think obviously that, you know, the biggest possible mistake is to misplay election day itself. I think the media has like thought a lot about a lot of the mistakes it made last time and is diligently trying to avoid them, which just means we will find some horrible new mistake to make. And just the glaringly, terrifyingly obvious one is to particularly on television on election night, you know, if the results aren't final to treat that like it's weird, like it's anomalous, like it's delegitimizing of the election when in fact, it means that people are counting votes. Um, and so I think, you know, that's likely to be, I mean, the, the likeliest scenario is that Trump is up on election day, but because they haven't counted all the votes and when they count all the absentees that Biden goes ahead. You could also easily imagine the opposite in Florida, um, you know, where it's very, very close and Trump pulls ahead later. But I think that, that sort of foot tapping irritation and skepticism that it could possibly take more than a couple hours to count, you know, hundreds of millions or tens of millions of ballots is really, really dangerous. And, and if you want to, the worst scenarios where things go off the rails happen there. I mean, they could, you know, media could go do a good job and things could still go off the rails. A lot depends on Fox News. There's a guy there named Arnon Mishkin, who's like their data guy. And if there's like one person on whom, you know, the sort of fate of American democracy rests, it's probably that guy. And the question of whether Fox News, you know, decides to tell Fox, tell Trump's base that the election is being stolen or not. Um, you know, it's going to be the decision of a couple of people and ultimately Rupert Murdoch. I mean, and what's interesting about the election, you know, the election night story is that in a way that's a local news story, right? I mean, it comes down to local election boards and to some level on how they report this and how they handle this. And I mean, my sense is that um, this is something that the Times and the Post and, and, BuzzFeed and others are really on top of and uh, obsessing about, but I don't know what the bandwidth is um, at the local level to to have the people to spend time on this. Do you know the answer to that or have a sense of it? I mean, I think there, like, there is actually this very like worthy project called, I think, Vote Beta that the American Journalism Pro Project people are wrangling that is aimed at, as I understand it, kind of financing this kind of stuff specifically, but, you know, on the local level. And I do think yeah, right, just like having a couple of local journalists at these election senators while senior citizens and junior clerks sort of painstakingly count ballots and drop a pile on the floor and pick it up. I mean, it's like very, very unglamorous is important. There's just also the, this like aesthetic gap between what you see on TV where you think that you're part of like a modern functioning high-tech country 
with these graphics and these like attractive people with makeup. And it's just, a, and, and there's, you know, it's such a bizarre thing in the US. We don't have a central election commission. The central election commission is Wolf Blitzer. You know, there's no other central calling of the vote. And so there's just this huge gap between the like, really the high quality production that happens in television and the very, very, you know, I think basically fair and, you know, as long as it's not too close, precise, but slow and analog vote counting that happens in a thousand different ways in every county. We're talking about this as if the, mm. as if the president were making sense and he doesn't. And so there's a, there's this very destabilizing, uncentering daily lunacy that damages that ability to just say, everybody just sit down and count. That's all we're going to do. You know, like that's like the normal sensible thing to do, but we're not living in a moment where the actual president of the United States has taken that view. So what that does to journalism is a really open question. What do you mean by that? We, we've talked before, Maria, about um, what is the obligation of journalism to, if you live in an extraordinary moment, how, how does journalism respond in an extraordinary way? Um, what should it, so adopting just, that view of yours, what, what does that mean? I just love what Ben said about, you know, the idea of just, there's facts and they're not glamorous and it's pieces of paper and people are marking the pieces of paper and somebody counts them. And there's nothing, it doesn't come with music or whizzing graphics or anything like that. It's just people doing a thing. But the person in charge right now of this system is a, is a creature of whizzing graphics uh, who doesn't abide by uh, any, any factual um, sort of grounding. But like the, our job is, is to, kind of do the paper and the counting and the talking and the meeting and locally like speaking with people who are who are actually responsible for this stuff so i think that the giant focus of journalism right now should be that if the president comes out on fox and friends and says that he's not going to accept that result of an election that he doesn't win as he did the responsibility of people in our position is to go and say this is the head of the republican party and get every single republican on the record explaining his views on that remark of their leader. And like, instead of getting all hysterical about it, it's like the, it's time for counting and paying attention and taping each and every one of them about that and getting everybody kind of back to facts. I asked what he was worried about um, going forward in terms of the Is this it for you, the, the election night, or are there other things to I'm sorry, I couldn't hear it. it. Kind of came out a little bit. Your yeah, I, I just wondered what else are you worried about in terms of the election coverage over the next two months? I I feel like there's the thing that worries me the most is the emotional response in 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 preference because people get all excited, you know. And this is a thing that I've written about numerous times uh, with respect to MSNBC because they could never resist, you know, a scandal. They love it. And so like, you know, when Mary Trump's book came out, it was all about like, you know, oh, he responded to her body and he was saying this and that about her. It's like, no, dude, like, can I, can I hear about the tax fraud? I don't really care about scandalous things that he said about his teenage niece. I care about laws that he broke, you know? And, and so this is a constant, constant thing that happens on MSNBC and other cable news and, you know, to a lesser degree uh, at, at newspapers. If there's an exciting, frightening thing to get everybody else stirred up about, but people will automatically gravitate to that. And it's a real mistake now. It's a, that's my biggest fear on like every level is that, you know, hysteria will, will occlude the ability to do the job properly. Um, I know that my... Can you hear me okay? Um, it's shaking. I'll yeah. do my best. Okay. Um, let me just say we have uh, more than 500 people on this um, webinar, and I encourage. Um, <laughs> hello. That's I encourage like you to. That's MSNBC day side numbers there. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
put questions in the question um, tab, and we'll get to them, uh, as many of them as we can. Um, but before we do that, this is for both of you. We have now, so we have sort of this moment in time where we have multiple massive stories unfolding at once. We have the election for the presidency. We have the coronavirus, which is far from being um, um, solved. We have continuing protests against systemic racism, and we have the climate crisis, which is unfolding um, today on the West Coast and in the Gulf of Mexico and elsewhere. So um, how, I mean, and we, and we just committed a sin that I'm gonna ask you about, which was siloing political coverage as politics. Um, it seems to me that the real job is to sort of tell this story as a whole, which is all of this stuff is, we're all living it at the same time. And voters are going to the poll, going to the polls and processing all this at the same time. So how do you, how, how does a news organization sort of reflect the moment that we're in that way um, in terms of covering all of this as a piece? Does anybody have any thoughts about that? Because I think it's, it's, it's something that we've written about at CJR, uh, my colleagues Alex Neeson and Betsy Murray, but I still think it's a problem. My approach as an editor is to um, telescope out, you know, find one person who is experiencing um, something personally and then extrapolate from that uh, so that people can empathize with what's going on. Like I thought one of the most powerful stories um, recently, I, I spoke with Alex Zelensky, who's a local reporter at the Portland Mercury, when, um, and this is a, an MSNBC story that I've been working on, because they, uh, after the, the mur murder there, um, uh, they chose to interview uh, a man named Joey Gibson, who turned out to have been the founder or leader of Patriot Prayer, the group that uh, was involved in, in the mess in, in Portland. And, and this reporter lives in Portland and had the story that should have been told that this person was like under indictment, you know, like he, you know, his lawyer is the Multnomah leader of the Multnomah Republican Party. There's like so many details that didn't emerge on cable TV because they didn't speak to a local reporter. And so like we're talking about local news and and being careful with the details. And I kind of feel like this is the key to everything. Talk to the people who live it. Then, then. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm, I'm a little hesitant to sort of tell, am I echoing? No, you're okay. That to, to sort of tell people in the practice of like daily, weekly, hourly journalism that they should try to have every story be, contain everything. Um, and to be this, you know, I mean, I think ultimately like the job to document what you see and bear witness and sometimes not get over your skis and not try to not come in with such a strong sense that you understand exactly how everything interlocks, that you're sort of immune to surprise. Um, I do think the one thing that journalists have mostly been not doing or have been doing a lot less of, which is good is, you know, there's nothing more, less meaningful than a re-election campaign than like how much is Trump the, you know, what, how much is he spending on ads in this state or that state? How much is, you know, do, did he hire or fire this political operative? I mean, it's fun stuff and I've covered it a lot in my life, but particularly with the reelection campaign, you know, this is the president. The important thing is the government. What is he doing with the government? What is he doing in this, particularly with the government in order to get himself reelected? And that kind of stuff is, you know, that's the center of, of what he's going to be judged on is, is, is the government of the United States that he is running, not some parallel nonsense political thing. Interesting, um, sorry, um, interesting question that came in on the Q&A, which is how do you think um, coverage of Trump would be different in a second term? Like what, what would, what would, how would news organizations fundamentally rethink how they, how they go about their business? Because they didn't after 2016 when there was a lot of questioning about what went wrong, what went right, there, there was, um, not a lot of the pledges for change actually came to pass. But, so what do you think would be different? Um, I think, I actually think it did, I think it did change more than you're giving people credit for, honestly. Like I think a lot of the, you know, call, you know, calling him a liar when he lies. Um, that actually happened before, that happened 
before the inauguration, but go ahead. Right. Treating racist campaigning as what it is rather than trying to sort of like think your way out of that. Um, but I think a lot of that stuff has changed. I mean, I think the sort of what's, you know, what used to be called the mainstream media is covering him as a sort of right wing demagogue who's outside the norms and running a racist campaign and lying all the time. I mean, I, I think it depends what your goal is in terms of change. I mean, I think you'll see some people saying, wow, we now have a media that really is locked in speaking to 30 some percent of the population and we need to like step back from that and broaden back out and speak to Trump voters. And I think you'll have other people saying, huh, like what is the role of like an opposition media that speaks mostly to the intelligentsia and, 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 um, and sort of professional classes and is no longer even like trying to persuade. I mean, I think like that, I think the, I think you, if you talk to editors and network presidents, they're kind of dancing around that choice right now. And I think that becomes starker in the second term. I don't think you can answer that question without reference to what happens in the Senate and Congress. Um, those, those are two whole different landscapes. Um, if, if there were, um, I, I mean, I, I guess it's possible to envision a, a future where he, uh, Trump would lose the Senate, but mean stay in the presidency. Um, if that were to happen, I think it would be very, very influential on news coverage because um, a, a, new, a Senate that was in Democratic hands would be trying to undo much of what had been done in the previous four years. And so this, it's just such a different world that you'd be living in. This thing is this, this, uh, Ben frame, which was you know, editors and presidents sort of trying to figure figure out, you know, are they an opposition force or are they um, a more traditional media force? I think I, that, um, um, I have a feeling I know Maria, <laughs> but where do you think they are on that continuum now? Um, I don't, you know, I, I don't really mean so much are they the opposition or not, like that's a framing that Trump likes. I think it's more like, who are you trying to talk to? Who's your, who's, uh -huh. who are you selling your product to, right? Like, are you, you know, and, and there are big groups of people who are alienated from the legacy media in the Trump movement, but also big groups among rural and more progressive and black audiences who, you know, who the New York Times isn't particularly talking to most of the time. And I think, I don't know. I mean, I think, I just think that there are these sort of commercial choices. I mean, a lot of it is like, you can play, pay for subscriptions if you're a subscription outlet. That, I, I, but I do think these, these outlets have, are still running on this idea that they're on everyone. And, and I think, I wonder how much longer that might sort of accelerate uh, kind of thinking about that. Um. Really interesting question from somebody in the audience about, um, you know, her, her point is that we, we seem to be talking a lot about sort of the top down of news and how people who run news organizations are thinking about this. But the fact is that the state of the news business for its workers and for freelancers is, is terrible. Um, and that, that that actually has an effect on the quality of news itself. Um, any thoughts, uh, uh, Maria, maybe you can first address this um, from, from your perspective of running something like Popula and then now Brickhouse. Yeah, it's been an absolute disaster trying to get money enough, you know, to, to pay people what they're worth. I mean, the, you know, the idea that you would write a 3000 word essay and get paid $250 for it is ridiculous. Nobody can live like that. The kind of work required to produce quality journalism is, is it's really painstaking, time consuming, it has to be done by really skilled, educated people. And, uh, you know, we need more money. This is like why I am starting this cooperative, you know, so that the money that uh, we receive goes directly to the people who are making the journalism. And I feel like people are finally starting to understand when they saw, you know, that Deadspin was literally going to end, you know, and they, they're able to get it back by paying for it and getting defector. Um, 
I think that this is starting to show people that if you want information, it's expensive and you have to pay for it. And the money that you pay can't go, wind up at Facebook. It's got to go in the pockets of the people who are making it so that they can like eat lunch. Ben, do you have any thoughts about what has to happen from, from the sort of the writer's side of the equation in terms of the models? I mean, I think there's been this, you know, real resurgence of the labor movement in journalism, you know, including in the South, which is sort of notoriously inhospitable to, to the Guild and WGA. Um, it, that, you know, partly speaks to this idea, you know, this just sort of reality that people don't feel like they can, that they were getting like a secure living out of and prospects out of these institutions they're attached to. But, you know, the underlying problem, you know, you can, you can organize, you know, a Gannett newspaper, but you're still dealing with these huge, huge economic issues that aren't, that, that may take the edge off and it may particularly take the edge off on the downside when people are getting laid off, but it's not, but it's not transformative. And, and I think, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think there's not, you know, I think there are these big kind of questions about, as Maria says, like where the money is, is going to come from that are, that are unanswered. I mean, obviously Google and Facebook have absorbed most of the growth in, in the ad industry for years. Um, but I, and yeah, I don't, I don't, I mean, I, I don't think you emerge from this period into, you know, with anywhere near as many journalists in America as there were in 2003. I don't think there's any world where that happens. I think, um, a, I think it ahead. will take a long time. And who, who, who would, who's gonna, I mean, ultimately it's like, who's, who's paying for the subscribers? Um, donors, I mean, or I guess it's a collection, but. The, the flows of money have to be altered. Uh, you know, in, in my, what I would consider to be the ideal world, we would be nationalizing Google. Like the NSA probably already has a search engine that is superior to Google. You could just take it over, get rid of all the stuff that they like got hold of illegally and make it like, you know, an ad free nationalized search engine. Like, you know, that sounds crazy, but you could do it. And that would immediately alter our information, the health of our information landscape. It would strengthen, you know, the, the, the sort of national consciousness of what it means to be told the truth and to find and gather information. There's like, you know, revolutions like this are possible and they're going to be required. You know, eventually we're going to have a responsible government. We have to get one in there and it has to start thinking like that. Take. And I guess I guess my, my view on that is that like the workers are probably unlikely to seize those means of production like in the in the near term. But <laughs> but that the you know but that the more traditional way that American industry deals with this sort of situation is that you do see and Facebook you know Facebook probably paid out a hundred million dollars to news organizations last year in part because like it's a little afraid of the peasants with pitchforks like Maria um, <laughs> and so like I do think that there is a push and pull between the media and the news industries. I think that probably does wind up helping only the biggest players, like really like they're very focused on buying off News Corp and Fox News and the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times to some degree, I would think. Um, yeah, and then, and then I think for, I mean, I think that there is, you know, this new real tech for individuals on a sort of niche or local level or people who have real, you know, passionate followings to make, a, to make a decent living that way on the sort of, and it does feel like almost every trend is either on the sort of giant institution end or on the sort of atomized level. And I think one of the really interesting things about what Maria is doing is it's trying to find a space in the middle. So let me, um, the, the, the group of panelists that's coming after you is gonna talk in more depth about this, but I still wanna hear what you think about and what solutions you have to the um, the demographic and diversity problem in news, which has really come to the fore um, as we've seen these protests against um, systemic racism and realize that uh, newsrooms um, aren't that equipped to be covering them in a, in a sophisticated way because they don't, the newsroom doesn't all represent the community that it's writing about. And this has been going on since really since the current commission report 50 years ago, and there's been you know, sort of plan after plan after plan and pledge after pledge after pledge and nothing seems to happen, uh, at least so far. Either. And so, um, 
And I think that there is a concern that I hear a lot of that um, as the industry uh, contracts, that um, it is journalists of color that will be affected disproportionately by by job cuts and that as it rebuilds, it they may not benefit from the rebuilding. Um, for both of you, sort of what is, do you see glimmers of hope that this dynamic is finally shifting or how do you assess it now? Yeah, hope. I mean, BLM has changed everything. I think that um, there's a symbiosis, you know, and this it has to do with the question that we were talking about before that came from the audience about, you know, individual journalists, freelancers, that there's a symbiosis between audience and, and journalists. What the, what people want to hear about and read about what becomes fascinating and interesting to them and has to relevant to their lives is going to get have more and more legs and like there's hardly a community in this country that hasn't been touched by BLM and you know, it, it's a very popular movement and it's in a direct opposition to the current government. And so we're living in this very passionate moment that addresses these uh, issues absolutely head on in a way that has not happened before in my lifetime. And it can only be good for the future. Yeah, and I, and I do think that it also, to some degree, has changed the, um, like, I think often this stuff is discussed in sort of the terms of HR, like, like, like news, like any business, you know, that you want to have more diversity and it's and and it is in fact good in lots of ways but sometimes like in a way that leaves out the substance of what we do and I think there you know there was this essentially traditional bargain that you could be a black reporter in a newsroom as long as you kind of bit your tongue on issues on issues of racism either internal to the newsroom or in stories that, that were being covered and I think you know one of the things about if you're going to have a diverse newsroom you're going to people who really disagree with each other on stuff and who come from different places and have a wider range of points of view and I think there's a growing realization that if you want a diverse newsroom, you sort of have to, you can't, it can't be on, it can't be entirely on the terms of the, you know, of the dominant culture or whatever, which, you know, and I think there's, there's a real conversation happening around, you know, what the sort of, you know, genuinely what it means to open these newsrooms to the perspectives of the black reporters in them, rather than to sort of demand that they, you know, almost condition of employment not, not express their views and their like lived expertise on issues of race. And I think that's a real, that feels like a very important shift to me. One of the greatest things that happened has happened in the wake of this movement is that um, mainstream Americans are now able to see that black culture is not a monolith. You know, you're, you're seeing sort of ta Coates come out and like have one set of perspectives at Cornell West and, you know, all kinds of people with different perspectives who, who live the Black experience and have so much to say about it. And so people are not understanding this anymore as like, you know, uh, there is, there's one idea that Black people have about how things should go. And I think it's just incredibly healthy and great. And it speaks to what you're saying, Ben. It's like, everybody needs to be able to talk and be heard and, um, open the open that the newsroom culture itself needs to be diversified intellectually even more than and then in any other way but, but i would also say that the newsrooms are still like figuring out i mean i certainly felt this at buzzfeed like what does it mean to have a newsroom where people look at the same thing and see it differently and you sort of acknowledge that and you know and reckon with it i mean i don't think it's a totally i'm not sure there's a totally simple answer to that or that it's just something where you check a box and go on as you were before. So final question, we almost always get these questions in a discussion like this, but it's sort of from a student who is sort of an aspiring journalist wanting to know, um, Ben was like, <laughs> wanting to know um, what should they do? Um, what should they focus on? How should they get in? Should they get in? What do you, you must hear this all the time, both of you, what do you tell people? Well, I have a, I had an amazing intern named Nick Gallagher. What they should do is find me and people like me who um, have an interest in um, helping young journalists and who love doing it and who will give them a way to get a byline and put them to work and uh, try and get them some money and, you know, have as many strings to your bow as you can, you know, learn how to do food writing, learn how to do sports writing, be ready to do whatever you're asked and um, be patient because change is coming. Um, yes, and, well, number one, see if you can get an internship with Maria. 
Um, but, or, you know, or, and there are a lot of, I mean, I think a lot of us like really love championing the careers of report, you know, young reporters and, you know, when, when we can, I guess uh, this turned out to be unpopular on Twitter the other day, but like break news, find a place that you can, it doesn't have to be news about Donald Trump, but find something that people really, really care about. And, and for, you know, if you can avoid it, not in New York, which is too crowded, like go some almost anywhere else. But if you can, you know, break news about water quality in Pittsburgh, you know, like these are stories that like thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people care a lot about. And if you can kind of go and figure out something that they did not know and tell it to them wherever you're working or whether you put it on Instagram written on a napkin, like that is also, that is a very good way to get the attention of editors. Yeah. If you, you just have to care a lot about it. You got to care a lot about what's going on and tell people yep. that's the whole job. Okay, okay, you're right. Care as much as your sources do care as much as your readers do. Um, this is, Ben, I'm sort of intrigued. I, I saw the blowback on this comment you made about breaking news and I didn't quite understand it either, but it, it was just for what it was. Um, what is what what is what has surprised you about the response from the sort of journalism world to like have you been able have you come up with a way to predict like what's gonna set people off? Everything always. I mean this was one where like I you know, I said something that I was talking about myself and you could read it. I think it's like I you know, you can only get you get your legitimacy from breaking news. Um, that is true of me and I think of reporters like me, but obviously that's not the only way to be a legitimate journalist in the world. Um, but I don't know, people, people, Twitter is not the place for charitable readings of other people's words. You can, there are other, I guess, social media platforms for that. Really? <laughs> I don't know of them, but I, but, but I, I hear. <laughs> no, I, I, hear, I know I, why yes. that happened. I totally know why that happened. People get very upset about the scoop happy, you know, like, this idea that journalists are just like ferreting out some scandal and they're gonna have a scoop and you know that's i don't really think that that is what ben was getting at but i understand that it is like, a little bit what i was getting at like it's yeah. really important i mean a big part of the job really is finding things that were that's like a powerful person how powerful people have lots of secrets and trying to keep them and it is so core to the job to go and find them not the only thing but i don't know I but the question is this, do you care more about being first than you care about being right? You know, do you care more? And this had been connected to the, the question of the Steele dossier also, which was an incredibly controversial, amazing thing. Yeah. I don't really agree with what you did. I thought it was necessary and right, but a lot of people didn't. And it was sort of associated with that. So it's sort of like, I want to be mm -hmm. first, you know, at whatever cost. And this is like, you know, the thing that people get, become critical of. The second hour will be Maria and I talking about this on a <laughs> private. On a, on a, uh, We've got a three minutes. Zoom. Um, you know, I guess I actually think, I mean, right, there is, there are sort of, there's a kind of tradey journalism where you're getting scoops that people are feeding you and, and it's, and it's not, it, I mean, scoop, the good scoops are the ones that somebody didn't, is, is angry about, didn't want you to break. But I think that like when people say, you know, you don't, there's, a, there's obviously a tension between being first and being right. But what I've, I've always found is that the reporters who have like deeply insinuated themselves into an institution, like the person who like, who I get like DMs most from that is like scoop, I got a scoop, tweet my scoop is, um, sorry, I'm going to out him here is Hamed Alaziz who covers ICE for BuzzFeed. And um, like he gets tons of scoops because he is just totally inside that institution. He knows everything that's going on. He talks to everybody in there. He understands the thing. And the scoops are basically a byproduct of being totally, totally wired into this institution. Mm -hmm. um, but, and, and like, they're not, the, not a totally reliable signal that a reporter knows what they're talking about because they could also just be a tool to be a PR person. But if you have a reporter who's getting lots of scoops, Maggie Haberman, somebody like that, it's a pretty good signal when they say, hey, here's what's really going on, that they actually know that they're not guessing. Right. Yeah, that's a subtle distinction that you would not be able to make, you know, in 240 characters or whatever, or 280. <laughs> but yeah. uh, I think it's very much worth thinking about the difference, right? Because a lot of times it's not evident who is, you know, who's sort of uh, become what they beheld, you know, and who is like just paying attention really closely and is serving the reader first. Yeah, and most reporters are some of both. Um, this has been great. I really appreciate both of you coming on. Um, ben, Maria, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, to those of you listening, apologize for if you, if it was uh, if you heard some glitches. We'll see what we can do in the interim. Um, stay tuned. We're coming up in just a couple of minutes. Um, we have a discussion about who is journalism for and who is doing the journalism uh, moderated by uh, Susan Smith Richardson. So, be back to you in just a minute. Thanks for listening.
Hey, welcome back. I'm Kyle Pope, uh, editor and publisher of the Columbia Journalism Review. Thank you all uh, who joined us in the previous session uh, with Ben Smith and Maria Bustillos. Uh, my job here is simply to introduce this amazing group of people uh, who you're going to hear from over the next hour and their moderator, uh, Susan Smith Richardson. Um, she is news editor. Uh, I'm sorry, she's the chief executive officer of the Center for Public Integrity in Washington, D.C. Until 2019, she was editorial director of newsrooms for the Solutions Journalism Network. And where I worked with her uh, most recently was previously the editor and publisher of the Chicago Reporter. Susan, thank you so much for doing this, and I look forward to hearing from all of you. Okay. Thank you, Kyle. Happy to be here. And uh, happy to be with this wonderful group of folks, several of whom I have had the pleasure of working with in the past as well. So let me do a little table setting for, for our panel. Obviously, this is the conversation, who is journalism for? So I want to start by setting the table a little bit. Um, many of these issues that journalists face today are longstanding. They predate COVID. The uprising for racial justice that we're seeing playing out across the country and for equity that we're seeing playing out in many of our newsrooms across the country. So our conversation is coming at a time as news organizations are struggling to develop sustainable business models editorially and financially, but also as we deal with a bigger question in American democracy, and that is how can journalists serve, engage, and equip communities in a multiracial, multicultural country. So this panel is going to deal with a piece of this bigger question, and that piece is who is journalism for? So I wanna start off by introducing folks. Andrea Valdez is the editor-in-chief of the 19th. Bettina Chang is a co-founder and editorial director at City Bureau. And Sul Chan is the editorial page editor at the Los Angeles Times. I also want to remind everybody to please share your questions as we go. I'll jump in and out of those questions after we get our conversation going. So thank you, and thanks again to the panelists. So I want to start off with a question uh, to Sul. Because both of us have, have been around for a while and have been a part of many of these conversations uh, about who journalism is for and audience. So I want to start off with something really to me kind of fundamental to the conversation. We've been talking a lot about representation, especially racial representation in newsrooms. We know that matters and that is closely tied to who gets to tell the story and most important, frame the story and who we're talking to when we talk about audiences for news. So I wanna start off with this question. What are the benefits and limitations of representation? Hi everyone, I've been here all along, but my apologies for uh, the technical and delay in getting started. Uh, really thanks to CJR and thanks to this, this incredible panel. I'm really an honor to speak with you all. Um, I think when we think about representation, we're, we're increasingly thinking about at least three aspects of, of making journalism more people-centered. Um, whose stories we tell, who gets to tell the stories, and for whom are we telling the stories? And I actually think the three are distinct questions. When we've historically talked about representation, I think we've talked about a little bit more about diversifying newsrooms. And we have a long, long way to go on that, given that the Goals set for the year 2000 were missed by the industry. Now they've been pushed back to 2020, 2020 and beyond. We don't have the time to wait. But I think all three questions actually have to be addressed simultaneously because representation, you know, is not enough. We need a much more uh, morally nuanced, a much more morally expansive, a much more generous understanding of who it is that uh, journalism is for. And really reflecting on some of the comments that um, uh, Ben and Maria made in the last panel, you know, I think we have to increasingly think about, you know, journalism as a democracy protecting act and journalism really as an educational process, because it's clear that if we only reach people who are used to receiving mainstream news and desire it, important as those readers are and as important as those as the as that audience is, that's not really going to be enough to kind of rescue our democracy. And I think uh, that that's a big part of what I, I hope we can talk about. So I want to ask you a follow up. Talk about journalism as part of it our educational process. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I think that, you know, we've, there's a giant um, 
there's clearly a gap in America going on, I think, um, with trust. I think we, if you look at the history of the US since the 1970s, trust in institutions has been declining across the board. Um, the two areas that still retain the most trust are the military and the judiciary, and trust there is sadly eroding as well. I think there was a recent Pew study that looked at uh, trust in journalists, and uh, we were near the bottom. We came out slightly ahead of elected officials. And I think that uh, that has to be addressed with humility. I think that we need to, we need kind of civics education. We, I support all the efforts at improving youth literacy. But I also think that we have to, you know, renew our education and understanding, you know, what is reliable news. I think the, the big, one of the biggest risks right now we have is that we're only existing in our own information silos and therefore only exposed to opinions and even, even more dangerously, facts or things purporting to be facts that we already agree with. Well, when we talk a lot about journalism, we don't also, we don't also when it comes to audiences, talk about access to information, you know, which I know is, is really, really a huge issue if you want to have a thriving democratic society. Folks have to have access to reliable, um, credible information. And we know that that is unequal in, in, uh, across communities. So I, I want to pivot to ask Andrea a question uh, about the function of the 19th. Then I kind of want to come back to a little bit more of this question, so, but I want Bettina to be able to rejoin us because so much of what City Bureau does is, is really grind down into what that means. So um, Andrea, just in, in thinking about audiences, who we, who we serve, who we should serve, and how journalism centers and defines audiences, Talk a little bit about the community that the 19th is attempting to build and how it is different or attempting to be different and how we define who journalism is for. Yeah, so to piggyback a little bit on what Sewell was saying, I do think that there is a trap that journalism can fall into where we speak to some of the same audiences over and over again, people who might be converted or um, already have some of the information and knowledge that we are reporting on. And so what we are trying to do is actually widen the scope of that audience. And we're doing that through a couple of things. One is our mission at the 19th, um, which is a new organization that reports at the end of politics and policy is to be nonpartisan. Um, so for us, it's really a matter of trying not to speak to the same you know, women or same readers that have been spoken to um, by journalism kind of you know, over and over again. We're trying to reach across the various ideological aisles and tell nuanced stories that we think give a real, you know, just a, a better, deeper sense of who the electorate is, who these women are, who these people are that care about gender equity or have been the victims of gender oppression in some way. So that's one thing that we're doing. Another thing that the 19th is doing, that's another part of our mission um, about it, that is uh, with regards to audience, is we are free to read and free to republish. Um, so what we are hoping is that without having a paywall, that perhaps we can have more readers, people who might be shut out of certain publications if they hit a paywall and they can't read any more stories and they can't afford to have another subscription. I know that there's subscription fatigue for people out there. We have to subscribe to every little thing it feels like these days. And while I do really, believe so strongly in the subscription model and I do believe that we have to have you know audience reader member support whatever that looks like for your organization for us free to read is a big part of of having you know maximum reach um, and then the free to republish because we do understand here at the 19th that you know journalism needs to be kind of linking arms organizations across the spectrum um, hopefully helping each other and so if stories that we are writing are a good fit for an outlet um, and can you know be you know something that they can uh, put in front of their readers that they think is of value? Then we want to have our stories out there too. Mm -hmm. I want to come back to something uh, about who you're attempting to serve because uh, you know just kicking off with what Tool was saying, there are pretty narrow definitions of the audiences that we or the communities. And let me put it that way because we're talking about information for people, not you know a demographic slice or you know, some algorithm, we're talking about real people and their ability to use and be served by information in, in the very basic things that they do every day in their lives, whether it's voting or figuring out, you know, if they're going to be able to figure, uh, fix a pothole on their street. So I want to be really mindful to talk about people and, and communities. Something, though, that 
it's it, it strikes me as somewhat different with what you're doing at the 19th is really thinking about this intersection with gender differently because it's it's really simple to say we serve women but we know that uh if you look at you me and bettina we're different women different experiences different racial backgrounds different class backgrounds and and it strikes me that one thing you're cognizant of is the fact that there has to be an attention to difference within groups which is a really different way of uh or mindful way of approaching who news is for and defining who you're trying to serve can you talk a little bit more about you know what what i'll just say is a more intersectional approach when it comes to gender yeah and you said it probably better than mm -hmm. i can mm -hmm. so thank you for that but yeah i i agree it's something that we are very intentional about the intersectionality of our stories so making sure that um our stories are being written by a diverse newsroom so you know we are we're you know, a lot of women, but we also have trans non-binary staffer on staff, which I think also brings some nuance to the gender perspective, specifically for us at the 19th. And we're, you know, happy that we're talking about that community. Um, but for us, it's also a matter of making sure that there's diversity in the newsroom, as Sewell said, who's telling those stories. There's diversity in our sources. So who's going to for experts? Who are we talking to um, in our stories? Who are we taking photographs of, um, and, you know, in the lead art of our stories? Um, and then also thinking about, um, you know, who we're trying to reach and making sure that that's intersectional too. And I think that if you see yourself as a reader reflected in the coverage, um, you know, either from the writer or from a photo that you see in, in the story, you're, you might be more likely to read that story itself. And so for us, it is very deliberate the way that we're approaching um, telling stories that are looking at, like you said, you know, Latinas and not just Latinas as a block. I mean, as we know, a lot of these, these um, you know, even when you look at um, Black women or Latinas or the LGBTQ community, you know, each one of those communities has their own nuance and their own slice of, you know, what that looks like within it. So, you know, Cuban Americans might be different than Puerto Rican Americans, first generation immigrants versus third generation, um, you know, uh, immigrant families. So we are thinking about all of those things and the stories that we're assigning. And that comes from, you know, the ideas that the writers are bringing. And of course, that comes from having a diverse newsroom. Um, and then, you know, frankly, someone that looks like me at the top of the masthead, which is um, you know, I, I don't want to, I'm not here to pat myself on the back or anything like that, but I do want to acknowledge that, you know, I think it's roughly 75% of uh, newspaper editors are, are white men. And so I'm a little bit of an outlier here. And I think that that does make a difference in what stories we choose and, and how we cover them. I think that's a really important point and it circles back to what I was asking so at the beginning. And this is kind of the limit, the limits and benefits of representation. But I want to lean in a little bit more on, on the limits, right? And, and set this up uh, for Bettina to talk a lot more about. Um, representation, as we know, matters. But there's also a whole set of journalism norms that say who gets to tell a story, who is a valid source, who is, uh, who is the appropriate audience. All of those things that do limit the depth, quality, authenticity, accuracy, and, and value of news and information, especially when you think about uh, uh, communities of color and uh, working class and other communities. So I, I want to go to Bettina to talk a little bit more about the connection between representation, but also challenging journalism norms. How do we begin to, when we talk about serving communities, look at issues of what's defined as news and what is defined as newsworthy. And talk a little bit about how City Bureau maybe uh, challenges, you know, what I would just call often white patriarchal kind of supremacist notions of, of, of what is news. Hi everyone and thanks Susan for that intro. Um, my apologies, of course, I'm on like seven Zooms a day and it's not until I have an <laughs> audience of 500 people that my router decides to give out. Um, but anyways, um, I appreciate that question. I, I very much agree that, um, you know, diversity and representation falls short and has been proven to fall short in the American media system in the last, you know, 50 years. I, I don't know, I think it was over 50 years ago that ASNI had set a goal of, of creating full representation in the media industry in the 1960s. And um, I think they said they would do it by 2000 and 2000 rolled around and it still wasn't happening. And then they said, well, let's give it 10 more years and hope for the best and uh, look at where we are now. So 
Um, I think like the best way to sort of describe the way that I feel about journalism and representation is like, if you think about an organization, and I'm going to, I'm going to exaggerate on purpose here, so don't blame me. Um, but like the Ku Klux Klan, if they said to themselves today, like, hey, we have a representation problem, let's try to get some, let's get some diversity into the ranks, they're going to have a lot of trouble, uh, you know, trying to recruit people from diverse backgrounds. You know, when your institution actually upholds white supremacy, when it upholds the status quo that's oppressive to so many people, you can't really easily bring a lot of people into the fold to say like, hey, we really want to reform, can you help us? Um, I can't tell you how many people come to me and say like, hey, do you know any uh, journalists of color that would be good for this position? We really want to hire somebody who can help us with our diversity. Well, if you have a diversity problem, your strongest job applicants are not going to be interested in coming to your newsroom. So, um, you know, really, it, excuse me, the representation problem uh, in media is not just about the people who sit in newsrooms. It's about the way that we do our job. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, that's part of, um, the reason that, you know, this problem has been so immovable for so many decades. I was taking a look at some of the questions that we have coming in, but I, I want to ask you to kind of follow up on that, Bettina, and then, Andrea, I want to go back to you, because I also find myself in a, in a similar position thinking about representation. We know it does matter who who sits in your position, who sits in mine, and in, in Sewell's position as well. But we also know there's a really complex system of defining what's newsworthy that is behind that. And so often part of our challenge, say, as, as women of color, is to say, okay, how do we redefine that? And how do we um, challenge that canon? So, but Tina, I want to kind of come back and bear with me on my shorthand of how I'm going to define an aspect of what I think City Bureau does. And, and that is kind of interrogate the idea of who gets to decide what is news um, and how that affects uh, serving and equipping communities. So here's where I want to go square on with this question. And, and that's what's the relationship between uh, the decider and, and how we serve audiences. How is it different with your model where you engage communities in helping to define what is newsworthy and in actually the production of the news and, and what you end up creating? How do you think that is different from what you get uh, with a newsroom model that's completely different? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so our newsroom, we're a small nonprofit profit newsroom in Chicago. Um, we, the production of journalism is only about a third of the activities that we do. The rest of our work is very thoroughly around community engagement, hosting events, and also um, being able to deliver value in other ways. For instance, teaching skills to community members, um, bringing people into the fold of the journalism production process, even if they don't want to be full-time journalists, like, hey, can you help us comb through some spreadsheets? Do you mind, you know, calling five people today? and uh, reporting back to us. Um, these are all things that people in the community really love doing, actually. If they really care about the neighborhood where they live and they want to make a change, people are so excited to get involved. They're like, hey, yeah, teach me how to file a FOIA. You know, teach me how to interview uh, my dad about um, his experience as a union worker. Um, and we can pay people to do that. And in fact, by democratizing those skills, not only does the journalism that we create become more informed by people on the ground, it also makes it so that like there's more ways for us to build trust with community members because they don't just think of us as like oh they show up you know once a year and ask me what I think they also equip me with skills they give me paid opportunities they tell me exactly how journalism is made so that you know when a mistake is made I also understand how that mistake got made right um, I saw somebody in the chat asked you know is community journalism um, just low quality journalism and is that ever going to be, you know, a good way for us to provide grassroots information to people. And I think the answer to that is up to us, right? Like we as professional journalists all have the ability to work in concert with community journalists and say like, hey, I saw this story that you wrote. I really love these like sources that you got. You know, I, I'm not 100% sure if I agree with your take on blank or like I sort of feel like you gave this politician you know, a little bit too much leeway to talk about this issue. Like what if they are influenced by blank, right? And so like 
if we as people who are privileged enough to have this kind of journalism training are willing to share those resources, it actually makes our jobs easier altogether, not only by building trust, not only by building an audience, not only by bringing people into our work, but really like as a collaborative effort, really redefining what is journalism, what is newsworthy, and who gets served by the work that we do. So thank you, Bettina. So I want to invite, uh, invite Andrea and Sol into, in, into this conversation. Um, and, and, and that's kind of looking at this question of the relationship between engagement and how we define who journalism is for. What's the role of engagement in being able to develop and cultivate audiences? And then our bigger question from this panel, who is journalism for? Andrea or Sol, who, whoever wants to go first. Then I'll go to some of our chat questions. Andrea, do you want to take that? I was going to say, you go ahead. You, you can speak <laughs> sure. first. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. The question of engagement is one I'm, I'm engaging with more um, <laughs> as opinion editor. In fact, a lot of publications, including some in the Gannett family, are, have actually merged the engagement and, uh, and opinion roles. You know, in our, team, in our newsroom, we have an audience engagement team that's focusing a lot on not only the tactics, but the strategy around finding you know, audi new audiences on new digital platforms. But I actually take the word engagement to mean broadly community engagement. Um, you know, certain newspapers, uh, ours is not immune, have at times been associated with elitism and with you know, really serving the interests of kind of the, um, the very powerful. Um, at the LA Times that that's been particularly pronounced because really the founders of the newspaper also kind of helped build modern Los Angeles. So there's an intense association of the Los Angeles Times with a certain kind of power structure and a certain kind of corporate and civic uh, elite. You know, um, if you see the movie Chinatown, you see one simplified and, but dis and distorted, but nonetheless uh, grounded in truth uh, uh, version of that. So, you know, a couple of things. Um, we are trying to be transparent in all our methods. When we en endorsed Biden for president last week, we also included a long story about how the LA Times only endorsed Republicans for president for, the, for its first century all the way through Nixon and explain who the editorial board is now and why we're even, you know, why we even think uh, we should offer an opinion and just do that with humility. Um, we, you know, we're very proud to be locally owned for the first time in 20 years, uh, as of two years ago. And I'm very excited to, to announce that um, later this month, the LA Times will be publishing an institutional reckoning um, with, uh, with race and with our racist past. It will look at um, real lapses in our coverage, real lapses in our judgment, and missed opportunities to become a more diverse organization. And uh, most importantly, I think, in addition to taking ownership and, and taking assuming accountability for the past, we will pledge to do better in the future. And so we're excited about that. A number of our newsroom journalists are also involved, especially journalists of color, writing about their experiences at the LA Times. And we think that this can be an act of healing and reconciliation, but most importantly, it creates a new, uh, it will create, we hope, new uh, metrics for accountability so that we in our present day can be held accountable by those who come after us to see whether we met our uh, our era's demands for a more inclusive, uh, diverse, and just newsroom. Hmm. Uh, Andrea, I, I want you to, to uh, answer this question too, but I want to come back to what uh, Sewell was saying because it strikes me there's two pieces of history, Carter Commission Report is one, and a piece of that we never talk about, um, which involved actually doing public hearings, right, uh, with communities. And, and a second issue too is really how do you define those, you know, metrics for, for progress, so to speak? Uh, and then I know there's some different initiatives happening in Chicago that uh, Bettina could talk about. But uh, Andrea, did you want to comment about the role of engagement before we dive into what Sul was just saying? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll just quickly go over two things that I think um, have evolved in journalism and that you know, I feel like I've, I've seen and many people probably here have seen uh, a front row seat in that evolution is um, social media obviously is a key part of engagement. Um, but I think that journalism and uh, journalistic organizations have gone largely from using social media as a megaphone to just, you know, announce here's new stories, you should read them and use them more as a tool for a dialogue and to have two way conversation. And, you know, there's a whole different conversation about the role social media and the social media platforms are playing and the role of journalism. But I do think that is one that has actually afforded some better um, ways to communicate with your audience. And I, I do think that there's value in that if that's used and wielded correctly. Um, and then the other piece of it is that for the 19th community is 
a huge part of our mission and it's something that we are really um, you know, bent on being engaged with our community. And a lot of it is by soliciting stories from our community, um, using our, our newsletters to, to reach out to folks and, and ask them to share their stories with us, um, you know, and, and be transparent about sometimes, you know, we would like to follow up with you and report on those stories. And sometimes it's just a matter of we want to hear your stories. And I think that um, communities want to know that they have been asked and they have been listened to. And I think that's a really important part of the process too for, for journalists to listen to their community um, and, and just create a space for that. Okay. Thank you. So I, I wanna go back to what Sol was saying and then I promise everybody don't give up on the chat. We're coming back to those questions in just a minute. I just wanna finish out this thought and get everybody to kind of kind of weigh in on this and then we're gonna turn full square to a couple of back-to-back -back questions in, in the chat room. And, and this is the process that the LA Times is, is going through now. I think this is really interesting. So um, knowing that some of this was on the, the horizon, I've been thinking a lot about the Kerner Commission from 1968. We almost use this as foundational when we look at measuring progress on some level around um, both not just racial equity issues in newsrooms, because I don't want to say it's a diversity issue, it's a power issue, and, and also relationship with newsrooms to communities that are not white and male and everything else that becomes kind of the centered community for news. Um, one of the pieces of, of, of the work done by the Kerner Commission uh, leading up to its 68 report was, was having a level of public hearings in communities. And, and this meant that folks had a chance to talk, journalists had a chance to talk about what they do and communities had a chance to talk about what they felt was or wasn't there. And it, it ties in very much with what Sul was saying in the sense of how do you go about really having a reckoning? We are, you know, dead center in a moment where institutions, and I don't know, Andrea, and you and Sul both talked about this, major institutions in this country are being challenged again, not new. And journalism, of course, is being forced, as it should be, into the same conversation about institutional racism and, and its role in perpetuating white, white supremacy and privilege. So these conversations about the historic role of news organizations are, it seems to me, critical if folks are going to move forward. So I wanna talk a little bit about, so what does that look like and how do you have metrics? So Bettina, I know in Chicago, there are some initiatives to look at how to address this. Talk about what's happening there and how do you begin to define metrics for, for, for progress? Because I mean, you know, if you've been around a minute, You've heard it before and you've seen these numbers before, and I'm not just talking about ASME numbers. So uh, talk to us a little bit about how folks are aligning there in Chicago and what efforts are underway to create more a more equitable, I guess we'd say, news and information system. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, definitely. And I, I really appreciate Sewell's example of what the LA Times is doing, which is great, like that it's so important to look at the history of our institution and say, what have we done here? Um, in the same way that, for instance, the 1619 Project has brought a reckoning for us to look at American history, um, this is an opportunity for journalism to take a deeper look into our own history of how we have contributed to racism. Um, I think uh, one thing I want to bring up is that City Bureau is signing on to a, a, a citywide, actually, in sh Chicago, an initiative called Just Action, uh, which is a group of organizations that has is looking at racial equity in a really deep way and asking folks to commit to more than just saying we commit to equity, right? Because equity, racial equity is not a declaration, it's a muscle. It needs to be exercised regularly. Otherwise, it goes away very, very fast. Um, you know, you're constantly working against the reality that we live in, which is a very, un, a very unjust reality that is upheld by patriarchy, white supremacy, all of that. Um, and so you have to be constantly working against it. And so, you know, the what I really love about this uh, Just Action initiative that we sign on to is they create this very specific framework that works across uh, different types of industries, which is number one, acknowledge history, right? Much like the LA Times is doing. Number two, shift power, 
right? Because as you said, Susan, um, diversity and representation is not just, is not the answer. It's about power, who has power. Um, so if you can shift it, then you can start making a difference, right? And number three, embrace accountability. So again, creating a cycle, because you know that this is a muscle that needs to be exercised to create ways for the people that you're serving to have real accountability or to, to be able to hold you accountable, right? Like, how can I give you the tools to hold me accountable? Because your accountability is a gift to me because you care enough that you want me to survive that you're trying to hold me accountable. And you know, like not every publication out there has that, right? Like sometimes we should feel super lucky that anyone wants to hold us accountable. Um, so that's the framework. You asked me a more specific question, Susan, and I just forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just had to do with uh, how you define progress toward the goal. Because, you know, this is something Sol brought up as well. How do you define progress toward the goal? And then you're talking about, you know, it's not one and done and it's not yesterday. It's uh, if the problem is decades and generations in the making, it is, you know, <laughs> uh, not it's more than a minute in the in the in the addressing or solution yeah yeah definitely i mean a defined progress if i had the perfect impact mm -hmm. metrics for this mm -hmm. i would be a bajillion yeah. <laughs> you know? well that's like, true um, but yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, beyond the diversity metrics, I would say there are a lot of folks out there who are working on, like, how do you make media more racially mm -hmm. equitable? Mm -hmm. And you could, mm -hmm. the metrics could be as simple as, you know, have you done the things that people have been mm -hmm. asking for, right? Mm -hmm. So like for decades, people have been asking, can you please capitalize the B in Black? Right, because like you know, Black Americans are a very specific racial group, and like the fact that you're not capitalizing it says something about the way you think about that group. You know, have you stopped posting the mugshots of people who are charged of crimes but not yet convicted? It is just a very basic thing, you know, that a lot of people have been asking for a long time. People who think about racial equity every single day, who have been affected by the racist practices of news, and you know, like, can you just do the things that people have asked, right? <laughs> like, feel like that's a really, really uh, a different kind of metric, but a really great one that I think is worth looking at because it's not like there aren't people who have been trying to hold us accountable for decades. Like, there are solutions out there, mm -hmm. and most institutions just haven't done it yet. So did you want to comment on that before I go to uh, a couple of our questions in the chat room? Yeah, I, I'm very sympathetic to almost everything that Tina is saying. I, um, I'm, I'm, I do think that one of the challenges right now, and this gets back to the first panel today, is that the business model, you know, the, the movement long delayed for racial justice is, you know, affecting, sweeping through the news media at a time when it's going through such gigantic economic challenges. Um, you know, Ben noted that, you know, most Americans still get their original news and insights from print newspapers, but he also described them as dying. And I think that is, uh, that's largely accurate. I think the, the figures that concern me the most, we've been talking at a very lofty and even national or even global level mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. today. But if you think about local news, that's really where the mass extinction event is occurring. 45% of local newspaper journalism jobs have been lost in America since the Great Recession of 2007 to 2009. So all sorts of institutions, school boards, water boards, tax districts, um, state legislatures, city councils aren't being covered. And that's where I fear the most because you both have the potential for increased corruption. But those were also jobs that could have gone toward, you know, cultivating and bringing up a new generation of journalists, one that's much more diverse. So the challenges are really immense right now. We've got a technological challenge, a business model challenge, a, um, a, 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 the challenge of better representing our communities. And then, of course, that's all happening against the backdrop of a rapidly changing America, one in which four in 10 people are uh, now identified as people of color. Absolutely. So kind of piggybacking on that point, I'm looking at uh, one of our questions and, and here we go. Is it possible to have a sustainable for-profit business model without assuring audiences transparency about how news organizations decide what, why, and how they cover stories? and how they tackle the dynamics with pressure groups. Let me take the first part of that question. Is it possible to have a sustainable for-profit business model without assuring audiences transparency about how news organizations decide what, why, and how they cover stories? Uh, Andrea, would you like to start with that? <laughs> I mean, as a nonprofit, uh, it's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, 
maybe, maybe not. I'm the best person, but I'm happy to speak to it. I, mean, I worked in okay. profit media for a while. Um, yes. And look, I think that's a really tough question. And like Bettina said about impact, if I knew the answer to that, then I would probably be mm -hmm. in <laughs> doing different things and in a different part of the newsroom, even in the organization. Um, I, I think for the for I think the for profit model is having a tough time, especially right now. So many businesses obviously are having a tough time during the pandemic, but journalism for sure, because not only has the ad model fallen out in a lot of ways, because a lot of advertising has been siphoned off by, you know, a couple of big tech companies, right? So that's mm -hmm. taken away a lot of that. You know, there was a revenue stream that I think some for profit places, and so you can speak to this more than I can, um, but we're relying on with regards to community events or events in general, and events have largely gone away because of safety concerns. Um, and that there has been a lot of attention paid to the subscription model, and I think that is the right way to go. But the concern, of course, with the subscription model is I think someone in the chat had mentioned the digital divide, and that's something mm -hmm. that I'm very aware of. That if if you if you create an ecosystem where information, good information, accurate information, is information that you have to pay for, then free information might be less valuable and and less accurate and then you create an information divide and that is something that does concern me um i don't want to discount that there is a path forward for for-profit media i think that there are some really good organizations that are are trying to figure that thing out um but it it just means that the organization itself might look a little different so i guess that speaks to the second part of the question and mm -hmm. i do think that it is a big challenge and i think that's why we have seen a lot of nonprofit media companies which the 19th is a nonprofit media company, but but that has um, there's been a, a a real interest in that uh, business model for journalism going. I'm happy. Mm -hmm. to okay. Yes. Let me go to uh, let me go to another question, and we'll we'll circle back to that one. Um, how can emerging journalists of color seek out more autonomy and equity in mainstream media, and by that the uh, person is asking bylines, fair wages, et cetera. Well, yeah, I think some of these are the issues that are actually, you know, giving the greatest energy to the, the labor organizing and collective, uh, um, collective action movements that we're seeing in newsrooms. You know, I have an interesting take on this, I think, in that I was a you know, member of the News Guild uh, as a reporter uh, for 10 years, and then I've been a manager now um, in uh, two different newsrooms for the last 10 years. So I really have seen both sides of it. And I, I think that you know, in, a, in a healthy company, it is a relationship that is a partnership rather than necessarily an adversarial relationship. There will be times of disagreement, but a mature labor management relationship really has people working together for the benefit of the institution. You know, I think um, newsroom cultures have changed, there's no doubt about that. I think some of the practices that probably were tolerated 25 years ago when I first started uh, uh, as a journalism intern, you know, a, a bit of the shouting, a bit of the, uh, of the, of the tempers flaring, uh, certainly perhaps some consumption of substances in the newsroom uh, really would not be uh, would not fly right now as uh, <laughs> as, uh, as professional environments and uh, you know and I don't and I don't say that lightly of course you know we as journalists have to follow high ethical standards if we expect our staff to trust us and if we expect our readers to trust us so yeah. you know I think there's a lot that's that's happened that's better but I what I do think is happening in the culture and I think this tracks generational changes at large is you know we I, anyone who's paying attention knows that you know the millennial generation and to some extent Gen Z right behind it, really are the largest generation already in American history. Mm -hmm. And they, it may take a few years for their electoral uh, uh, power to be felt, but certainly their uh, organizational impact is already being felt in all our workplaces. And uh, you know, it can be easy to oversimplify mm -hmm. generational divisions. I don't wanna do that here. But what I do think is happening is you know, a desire for uh, greater autonomy, greater communication, greater feedback. Um, uh, visibility, you know, it's, uh, we, we're all learning that uh, to have a healthy organization, it's not just that you're publishing someone's work, but also that your employees feel recognized and seen and visible and heard and that they feel a sense of belonging. And I think that journalism has often been, we've been very poor as HR organizations. We have sometimes been very poor places to work. I think journalists at its best are, you know, we're deadline driven, we're bursting with curiosity where we, you know, we're wisecrack a little, but we also now have to actually become really good workplaces. 
because I think talent is going to be the big one of the biggest drivers in the 21st century. You know, it could be the 25 years from now, you know, AI is writing some of the more basic articles. Well, I hope that doesn't mean there's no need for journalists. What I think there will be need for a need for is journalists who can do the data visualization, who can uh, use predictive analytics, who can crunch big data sets, who can and really go deep with narrative. You're, you know, you're not going to be able to automate the emotional intelligence that is involved in getting uh, someone to talk, especially if they're, if they've suffered or have major experiences. So I think the combination of kind of technology change and also, you know, improvements in our organizational dynamics could help create a better future. For, uh, you know, I'd say to that young journalist, you know, uh, I, I know you're impatient, but give us a little bit of time. I think this field is getting better. I think it is economically struggling, but I think ultimately it will end up in a more uh, morally purposeful direction. Andrea or Bettina, do, do you have comments on any thoughts? Um, you know, at City Bureau, we have a fellowship program, and that fellowship program is uh, usually at least 75% people of color. Um, and we really um, focus on training folks who are underrepresented in the industry specifically because we know that this is a problem and we want to be part of the solution. Um, what I would say is there's two different types of advice that I give to young journalists of color. One, one piece of, you know, like on one end, it's sort of like, okay, like this is how you fight. Right, like this, these are the ways that you can fight from within a newsroom. And then for the other group is this is how you fight from outside of a newsroom. Um, and so my advice is to anyone who's trying to enter the industry right now, like, yes, like, you know, what Sewell said, like, I, I, I'm feeling optimistic. I, there's no way I could do my job if I didn't feel optimistic about it. However, don't go easy on us. You know, like, don't go easy on the newsroom that you're in. Um, be ready to fight the way that you fight to talk to a source, the way that you fight for a FOIA. You know, fight with your newsroom managers and say, like, you know, I demand to be treated, you know, fairly here. Um, and then, you know, also, and maybe this gets us back to the, um, to the business model thing, is, is understand who's, who's got your paycheck. You know, understand what are the financial incentives, because whether you're a for-profit or not-for-profit, I mean, it doesn't say anything about how much profit you make. It's just about what you do with it, right? So, like, there are nonprofits out there who are raking in tons of profit. They're just putting it back into the organization or, um, you know, assorted other things that I'm sure the journalists in the room have feelings about. Um, but, but, you know, understand, like, where does that money come from? Because, like, when you are upset, like, who do you go to pressure? Do you go, are you going to go public? Are you going to tell people, hey, unsubscribe from this publication because they treated me poorly? Are you going to go straight to their advertisers to be like, hey, like, stop advertising here because look what happened? Or are you going to... Um, you know, like the, the foundations that fund the nonprofits to say like, hey, like you cannot keep funding this organization if it, if it's not representative of my community. Um, if you can understand the business side of things, which I know in J school is like often taught as like a dirty thing that you shouldn't know how it works, throw that out the door, figure out who pays the bills and get ready to fight for it, you know, when the time comes. Thank you. I, I want to go to a question that, that kind of sort of sidelines with this one. Um, here we go. Beyond the questions over which stories are told and who tells the story, um, here's a question. Can we talk about the purpose of our stories? Given the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement, shouldn't journalists today dedicate their work to dismantling social injustices? And can journalists today also be social justice advocates? Um, this is an immensely uh, uh, charged topic, and uh, mm -hmm. I'd like to take a crack at it. I think, <laughs> look, I think in the long run, um, there are a certain set of universal ideals that I think all journalists working in Western demo in modern democracies can stand behind. They're at a very broad level, however, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. Um, I would say that the dismantling of historic systems of white supremacy uh, is a part of commitment to those broader rights, including democracy and human rights. I mean, we, we need to be a, a morally centered craft. And I think our principles need to include these baseline things that help support a liberal democracy. That said, I would be a little bit more hesitant, and this is partly because of my training and that I've been a traditionally, traditional legacy journalist for more than 20 years, I'd be a little bit uh, more skeptical about kind of calling ourselves social justice warriors. I think, first of all, that may 
uh, give uh, too little credit to the social justice warriors who are in fact marching in the streets, who are putting their bodies on the line, who are taking immense risks with their personal safety to peacefully demonstrate and to bring about social change. I do think that we are ultimately observers and chroniclers, but we do so with a democracy protecting uh, goal that it is not simply, we don't simply break stories because, you know, it generates page views. We break stories on matters of significance because they can ultimately help an informed citizen govern themselves. And I, I guess I'm a little bit old fashioned here because I think at a time when institutions are under so much pressure, look at all these government agencies, look at our public health infrastructure, look at our judiciary, uh, yes, our law enforcement, I mean, often the pressure is correct, but, but you know, our institutions are really, really coming under a lot of pressure. They're, they're being urged to become better and more moral and more representative. And I think that includes the institutions of journalism as well. I'm very, very excited about the new institutions that Andrea and Bettina represent. But I also think that something really irreparable would be lost if we didn't try to invest in the legacy institutions that still do so much of the nation's original journalism. I, I want to pick up on that, and I really thank you for bringing that up before we go further, because there's an important point made here in the chat room uh, about Black-owned, or as the person uses the term, ethnic-focused, I like to say uh, people of color-led media that has been central to journalism in this country from day one, um, as opposed to this loose term we use like mainstream media, which is just another way of saying it in some cases, I got to find the right language. I will tend to say white-led corporate media, but there are different ways to define that. But I do want to accent the point that Sewell just made and that is in our chat room about these conversations we're having today, not bringing in media makers of color who have been dealing with issues of service, engagement, and, and equipping communities for the longest. And that truly uh, quite corporate-led media or whatever you want to call the conversation going on here can and should learn from. So I want to thank the person for bringing up that point. We need to be more precise and clear with our language and how, in fact, it leaves out uh, a whole history of, of journalism in, uh, that is based on serving communities that doesn't get celebrated or acknowledged as it should. So thank you for for the comment in the chat room and for correcting us and CJR shout out to deal with that next time we have a panel uh, because we, sh we, we must, we're missing an entire voice of the conversation. Uh, I don't wanna, I know that we are about to kind of close in on time and we've got five minutes left. So I hate to kind of short change some of the questions that are playing out here. So I'm gonna just have to say, I'm sorry, y'all. We're kind of pushing the clock here. I, I do wanna tie back, so, but, but thank you so much for the questions and, and being here. I kinda of wanna tie back all this rich conversation we've been having to where we started. Who is journalism for? Um, so in the spirit of moving forward, and a couple of questions are asking, well, you know, what the heck can we do? <laughs> uh, will we ever get to a point where you know, my daily newspaper, if I still have one, is going to be both representative, but also, you know, engage, uh, serve and equip my community. So let's, let's try to go out on, on this question. How can we incentivize news that doesn't fall into the kind of the old traps of the status quo when it comes to defining who journalism is for and who we should be, who we should be reaching as journalists? Uh, Andrea or Bettina, I'm looking at y'all. Who wants to, to, to start first? How do we incentivize creating that, that news that is really about, you know, who, how do we serve a, a truly real American audience, not the slices of audience that news organizations or I will say white corporate-led media has, has made its uh, bread and butter on? Mm -hmm. 
um, if you don't mind, Andrea, I'll <laughs> jump in, uh, partially because I want to sort of pick up on the last half of Sewell's last answer in, in addition, but, um, you know, answer for, for the issue of incentivizing better journalism, right? Like journalism is a market failure right now, especially if we're trying to provide information to people who are low income, people of color, people in rural communities, people in native communities. Like it's basically a market failure across the board, except for, for like the dominant wealthy white communities. Um, and so, you know, how do we solve something like that? I think that, you know, if you look at other market failures, the solutions are often either through government, right, public funding, or through nonprofit organizations. Like, say what you will about either of those solutions, but if we're going to learn something from the economics around here, um, highly recommend anyone who is interested, especially in low income information needs and like the um, informational quality divide that Andrea mentioned earlier, look into James Hamilton and Fiona Morgan, who've written a lot about the, this issue and, you know, have done a ton of work talking to people in low income communities, rural communities, being like, what is the best way for us to be of value, right? And so going back to like the idea of how do we incentivize this journalism, you know, I think that journalists need to recognize that we are part of an ecosystem, you know, whether it's with ethnic media or with social justice advocates, you know, we are part of an ecosystem in which like the people in a democracy need to be informed in order to participate. If they don't participate, then the democracy does not represent them. And that's the world that we're living in. So, you know, we journalists can't do it alone. We are holding on to our power like we think we can do it alone. We are holding on to our power in a way that basically tells everybody else that we think they're, we're better than them. But like why, you know, as I have said before, we have the opportunity to lift up all people together. We can lift up other community journalists. We can provide information that informs the social justice movements that, that you know, uh, provide for a better democracy. Um, and, so, and so I guess like, you know, again, I don't have a perfect solution, but, but I do think that in order to incentivize that work, we as an industry need to realize our position within that ecosystem, acknowledge it, acknowledge where other people are and try to move together, you know, to, to use our strengths to push, to push together. Uh, yeah, very quickly. I know we're running out of time. I, I will say that um, I want to stop and acknowledge that as a new organization, we are standing on the shoulders of lots of other organizations, not only mainstream media, but other ethnic media, to borrow that term, um, or, you know, just other organizations that have come before us. And we're in a fortunate place where the 19th gets to kind of pick and choose what we what kind of organization we want to build. We, we get to be the place that we have all wanted to see at this organization. And so I feel extraordinarily lucky to be uh, in a position like that. Um, you know, the other thing that I'd say is, and I'm not sure if this is speaking to the incentivizing news, but one parting shot that I would like to impart is I believe that possibly the pandemic, as awful as it is, there might be a silver lining to having some of the knowledge workers like people in Lee, and that it can show that there's a path where we can have people that are part of national newsrooms that don't necessarily have to be centered on a coast. Um, I come from Texas media. I am very partial to local media. I worked in local media for, you know, almost 15 years. So I am a huge, huge proponent of hire where the talent is. And so I hope that we can get to a place where we can maybe open up some of that and that allows for more people and different people to report news on the ground in their communities and that that will have a positive feedback loop with audiences mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. creating better journalism. Thank you, thank you. If I could piggyback, oh. yes. sorry, just piggyback on what Andrea said, and this is a really important point. I think one of the big stories of America over the last four decades, along with the erosion of trust, and in my view associated with it, has been the soaring and skyrocketing inequality in America. One reason I came out to Los Angeles, which is, I recognize another coast, uh, uh, but, uh, but I had lived all my life really in either the East Coast or, or briefly overseas, and I really felt after the 2016 election that we desperately need to reinvest in places in America that feel left, left behind or forgotten. Penny Abernathy's research into the news deserts is of such concern to me because it's showing that, you know, there's such a mapping. The places that have the most food insecurity are the places that have the fewest sources of reliable information uh, and are the least served places in America. Is it any surprise then that people living in those places 
uh, might be getting all their news and information from either talk radio or from Facebook. And, and, you know, I would probably would be if I was living in some of these news deserts. And I think that's one of the critical things that the organizations that have been fortunate enough to, to succeed really need to pay some attention to the small towns, the communities across America where there just aren't reporters, you know, on the ground. And I, I totally agree with what Andrea says. One thing good, good comes out, one thing that could be great coming out of this is if you see a more even distribution of journalists across America. Right now, journalists are so heavily concentrated in New York, Washington, and a little, and bits and pieces in San Francisco. Uh, uh, at Los Angeles and Houston. We're going to need a lot more. And that's why I'm excited also for reporting for America. Anything that sends journalists into places where there is too little journalism going on is an important thing. Okay. Thank you so much. So I, there are a number of other questions that are in the chat room, and I'm going to encourage uh, folks to sit tight for a second. Uh, Bettina, you'll see one for you. Andrea, there are some that mention you and Sewell. So if we have a second in between sessions to go in and, and maybe give folks answers to those questions. So if you have a question, sit tight, we're, we're gonna get to you. I, I wanna thank the panel. This was a terrific conversation. Thank you, Bettina, Andrea, Sewell, and, and thank you, Kyle. We'll go back to you. Um, Susan, thank you so much. I knew um, when this group sat down that this was gonna be a uh, informative and and thoughtful and challenging conversation and it's been all that um, amazing job thank you everybody um, so on a programming note um, we are continuing these conversations tomorrow same time two o'clock um, we'll be focused in two sessions one led by Emily Bell and the second by Jelani Todd on um, what do we want to rebuild when we think about journalism? And, and this is a subject that you all touched on here, but how do we hold news organizations accountable? So it's, it's an important and, um, and necessary, and I think helpful conversation, and we'll build on what you all um, talked about today. And again, I'm so appreciative. Thank you all for being here. Thank you all for watching, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you so much, Susan. That was really excellent.